I want to thank my Patreon supporters for helping make videos like this possible. Hello everyone, this is TJR. In case you are just tuning in, this is part four and the last part of my in-depth analysis of The White Album, 50th Anniversary Deluxe Box Set by The Beatles. In part one, I reviewed the Giles Martin remix. In part two, Robert Kinsler and myself discussed the 5.1 remix on Blu-ray. And in part three, I discussed the hardcover book. In this section, I will discuss the bonus CDs containing both the Esher demos and the session tracks. So let's get right to it. And let's start with the Esher demos, which I still keep wanting to pronounce as the Escher demos. I just can't help it. It's the Yankee in me. And it does drive the more pedantic internet trolls crazy. So if I do mispronounce this or anything else during this video, just remember, I'm trying to give the more anal retentive internet trolls out there some level of purpose in their otherwise mostly worthless lives. But now, let's talk about the Esher demos. Now, once again, I have to state that in recent interviews done in promotion for this release, Giles Martin has continually refudiated the long-held popular notion that the Beatles were splintering off and not getting along during the recording of the White Album, stating that the numerous conversations that can be heard on these tapes show them clearly having a good time together, and that furthermore, the session tracks and the Easter demos show them constantly collaborating. And I have to admit that I do hear that in a lot of these recordings. A one example is on the second of three alternate tracks for Good Night. You will hear what clearly has to be John Lennon on guitar since he's using the same finger-picking styling that he uses on Dear Prudence. And there are many more moments like this on these tracks where you can hear them collaborating. I think it's obvious that there would be moments when they might rub each other the wrong way. Who wouldn't when you're spending that much time in close proximity of each other? And yes, they were writing separately, but that they would then show each other their songs and then start creatively chipping in their musical contributions to what would be the final sound of the recording. In other words, they were playing like a band. He also goes on to state that he had never heard the Esher demos prior to his work remixing the White Album, and that when he finally did get to hear them, it was as a bootleg copy, and that he thought the audio quality was horrible, only to then discover that they had access to the original Esher demo tapes. While some of the Esher demos do sound like demos, what amazes me most about these recordings is just how close they come to being a complete album on their own, and how in some cases the demos are sometimes surprisingly close, and alternately surprisingly different from their final finished album versions. It's surprising to hear the strange tempo changes that John Lennon employs in his demo of Glass Onion and how it's later translated into the unsettling orchestral break on the album version's closing. I also found it interesting that the Isher demo version of Bungalow Bill works well as its own complete alternate version of the song, complete with animal noises and improvised production. So does McCartney's demo of Honey Pie. If this particular Isher demo had been released instead of the version that we did get on the album, I don't think that anyone would have said, hey, you know, it doesn't feel finished. And while the album's final version of Blackbird is definitely better than its Isher demo counterpart, in some respects, McCartney's demo actually has a bit more production than its final album version. Now, I understand that demos and outtake tracks like this are not everyone's cup of tea, but I feel that the issue demos are in most cases, and I stress, in most cases, complete enough that they satisfy as a kind of alternate version of the album. Closing out the issue demos are six tracks that never made it onto the White Album, but that Beatles fans will be familiar with, as most of them either made it onto Abbey Road or as a single or on individual Beatles solo albums. As for the two discs of session tracks, well, here is where we get into the much more hardcore fandom The first revelation comes from disc one, track one, with Revolution One, take 18. This 10 minute jam, for me anyways, gives a clear indication that the song Revolution and its audio abstract counterpart, Revolution Number no. Nine, were more than likely meant to be one complete 
musical piece. A song that starts as a pop rock song, but then evolves into abstract audio art. Of course, your mileage may vary as to whether or not you think this latter half is art or not, but that clearly was the intention. Ever since first hearing it, I thought that John Lennon was shouting the word rape in Revolution Number no. 9, but now, after listening to this outtake, I have discovered that he was actually shouting out the word right, and that a snippet of this was used in Revolution Number no. 9. Who knows how differently the slower, more acoustic version of Revolution 1 would have been regarded today if they had gone in this direction instead. Or how differently we might have reacted to Don't Pass Me By had they used the orchestral opening, which did get used in Yellow Submarine, on Ringo's debut track as a songwriter, Don't Pass Me By. In another interview for this set, Giles Martin states, we found this huge Pandora's box of material and that there were some really interesting things such as 107 takes of Sexy Sadie. He goes on to say that he and a small team at Abbey Road listened to all the outtakes and made notes, and that then they argued about what should and shouldn't be included, stating that the key to everything is that you want to tell a story about the album's making and give the audience buying the set something valid to listen to. There's no point in releasing something on this new set just for the sake of releasing it, and I mostly feel like this was done. I personally found plenty of little gems and surprises in these session tracks. And I'm really glad I didn't have to sit through 107 takes of Sexy Sadie. So thank you, Giles Martin and your team. But let's get back to the tracks. Earlier, I mentioned the version of Goodnight where John Lennon is playing guitar, but it's on take 22 that we get to hear a stark piano-led version of Goodnight without the lush orchestra. It's intimately beautiful. And once again, I have to wonder, what if they had gone this route instead? My feeling is that all this version needed was just a little bit more of instrumentation to round it out. One of my favorite session tracks on this set was Lost Paranoias, parenthesis Studio Jam, which is the Beatles just musically goofing off and having fun in much the same way they did with You Know My Name, Look Up the Number. Now, one thing that I kept hearing fans asking for in the months leading up to this set was the 27-minute version of Helter Skelter, and I'll have to admit, I was pretty curious about this too. Instead, we get a 12-minute slow blues jam of Helter Skelter. I know that some fans were disappointed with this, but perhaps there's a reason why it was never included. Perhaps the 22-minute version just doesn't live up to the hype. Perhaps this 12-minute version is much more listenable, and perhaps the 27-minute version is just a musical notepad jam session intended to work out ideas and doesn't offer enough of a listening value. Who knows? I'm going to trust the powers that be that there was a good reason for not releasing it, and to me, the best reason would be because it just wasn't very good. I have to admit, though, I'm not much of a bootleg collector, so if anyone out there who is of the bootleg collecting persuasion and has heard this 27 minute version of Helter Skelter, please, by all means, share your thoughts on this rather infamous version of Helter Skelter. I think we'd all be curious to hear what you have to say about it. Regardless of how you feel about session tracks from a famous album, there is one other thing that I want to state about the session tracks on this particular deluxe edition. After sampling the session tracks on 2017's Deluxe Sgt. Pepper box set, I probably kept only about half of them in my iTunes. With 2018's Wide Album Deluxe box set, however, I would estimate that probably 90% of these session tracks will stay in my iTunes. So what do you think? Did you listen to the Easter demos? Did you listen to the session tracks? What stood out for you the most? And what Beatle album do you think needs to get the deluxe box set treatment next time around? Looking forward to checking out your comments, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Hi, this is TJR. If you like this video, please be sure to click like, click subscribe, and also click the bell notifications icon so you can know when I release new videos. And if you'd like to help me make more videos, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash TJR, the original, and make a monthly pledge. Pledging as little as the cost of one cup of coffee a month can make a huge difference. 
Patreon supporters get access to exclusive early content, and it's also the best way to suggest a video topic. And even if you can't become a patron supporter at this time, I still want to say thank you for watching the video, and I look forward to checking out your comments.